historicism, who isn't anti? Is it not, as Karl Popper showed us in The Poverty of Historicism, the house philosophy of 20th century totalitarianism? Or in a different register, is it not the Victorian frame of mind from which we are all trying to escape? Even retooled as new historicism, has it not been a practice from which we have been almost always in retreat, an identity more often imputed than assumed? And yet, because we would recognise new historicism as productive of some of the most brilliant work in Victorian studies over the last 40 years, the recent efflorescence of anti-historicism suggests that this is a question to which it is timely to return. While this critique has not been without its stridency, until quite recently it was characterised primarily by moderation, and hence by, one might say, the poverty of its anti-historicism. As Lawrence Lerner confessed, the title of his 1993 essay, Against Historicism, was not a basis for argument, but of course a rhetorical gesture, directed not at falsity, but at limitations. And although during the 1980s and 1990s, Critics identified a whole series of concerns, not least new historicism's epistemological assumptions, its micro-historical methodologies, its Foucauldian pessimism. Responses fell well short of a comprehensive assault on its fundamental imperatives. Partly, of course, this is because neither historicism nor new historicism offer a stable or consistent target. The grand historical laws that concern Popper are fundamentally incompatible with the new historicism, itself famously leery of programmatic statements or a party line. Partly, it's been the lack of a credible alternative. Now, one possible exception is formalism. In some respects resurgent, at least since the publication in 1997 of Susan Wolfson's formal charges. And certainly since the millennium, scholars like Caroline Levine have been putting the case for a return to formalist modes of scholarship. And this call has been taken up in the pages of journals like ELH and by a generation of mostly American scholars. Here too, it's noticeable that until recently, the emphasis has been on recuperating the importance of form and identifying sites for the convergence of formalist and historicist methodologies, rather than repudiating the practice of historicism. So as Nancy Henry has suggested, the best new works have been those that balance historicism and formalism, providing both viable historical narratives and original interpretations of literary texts. In the last few years, however, a greater intolerance of historicist approaches, what we might think of with Marjorie Levinson as backlash new formalism, have become more visible. Take Rita Felsky's outspoken broadsides against contextualization or suspicious reading or the fragmenting and isolating effects of what she describes as the history as boxes approach. Since 2012, it has been possible to discern an emerging advocacy of formalism as alternative to, rather than complement to historicism, with a more pointed animus against historicist methods. We can see this, for example, in the way Anna Kornbler's Realising Capital, Financial and Psychic Economies in, the, in Victorian Form of 2013, flavours its formalism with a peppering of pot shots at the inadequacies of historicism and announces an aspiration of setting aside the new historicist orthodoxy. Even Carolyn Levine, in her just published forms, registers a more uncompromising rejection of the dreariness of the archive and the debilitating effects of historical distancing. <coughs> 
in this context, if I may, it's in this context that we must, understood the must understand the recent publication by the V21 Collective, an affiliation of largely American early career scholars, of a manifesto for a new Victorian studies. Along with the contributions and reflections it's generated and the public published work of its affiliates, the V21 manifesto articulates, albeit in a particularly uncompromising tone, several of the key components of contemporary anti-historicism. It arraigns Victorian studies for having become prey to what it describes as positivist historicism, a verificationist frame which involves an infatuation with the endless accumulation of mere information, a fetishization of the archival, and to some supposedly wrong in attempt to construct the past as it really was. It repeats the common accusation that the field is not just conceptually sclerotic, but actively anti-theoretical, ever more habitual and unreflective, unable to move from the concrete to the general and abstract, mired in a riskless factism, and the unreflexive use of evidence, requiring new speculative and synthetic methods. It takes up concerns that the operations of periodization and contextualization, arguing for the need to break accepted frames and chastising Victorian studies for its aspiration to definitively map the DNA of the period, for its narrow-minded address to only those scholars who care about Victorians as Victorians. And finally, it echoes, in this case surprisingly cautiously, calls for a renewed presentism, an escape from the prison of Victorian modes of thinking and for the deployment of Victorian scholarship to address the features of our own moment. Above all, the V21 intervention offers a direct repudiation of historicism. It advocates the further development of formalist interpretations or new formalisms, not primarily beholden to historical frames, as necessary for post-historicist interpretation, or indeed post-historicism. And so in doing so, it demonstrates the potential for the first time for a head-on challenge, particularly within the confines of Victorian studies, to historicist approaches. Now, elements of this manifesto, not least the call for multiple modalities of scholarship fit for a digital age, or for exploration of the ways of confronting the challenges and opportunities of an expanded digital archive, are welcome and timely. And few of us would object to a re-establishment of the field in the vanguard of new approaches, or to arguments that engage with and challenge multi-field and multidisciplinary conversations. Unfortunately, the more intolerant backlash new formalism of the V21 Collective is impoverished both in and indeed by its anti-historicism and likely to inhibit the very interdisciplinary conversation it purports to seek. In the first place, despite nods to Ronca and indeed to Popper, and despite the defining positivist, as in positivist historicism, neither the manifesto nor the wider engagements offer sufficient clarity or precision as to which of the potentially half a dozen, dozen verse, versions of historicism are at issue. Perhaps as a result, the object of this attack is a straw man. The accusation of crude empiricism and the suggestion of theoretical, theoretical aridity are both instances. Orthodox historical scholarship may in part be vulnerable to such a critique, but it is difficult to see where this position might actually be manifest in literary or cultural studies. 
Indeed, the irony is that the leading exponents of new historicism were motivated by and always attentive to precisely these questions of methods and the limits of our access to the past. Challenges and reworkings of Foucauldianism, the work of Chris Otter, Otter on the one hand, or Lauren Goodlad on the other, as well as the expanded formalism of Levine, exemplify the field's continued intellectual creativity. Thirdly, recent criticism treats as inherent and definitional aspects of historicist approaches which are certainly visible, but which in fact are merely accidental, undesirable, but capable of removal. This would include the construction of overtly discrete period categories and any incarcerable implications, as well as the tendency to deploy reductive ideas of a zeitgeist or homogenous cultural formation. It would include the verificationist frame, and it would certainly include any tendency to deny the significance of form. In both these respects, it's significant that the anti-historicist critique is characterised by its reluctance to identify specific instances of the errors it imputes and by the tendency to excuse its leading studies while indicting their imitators. Fourthly, entirely unjustifiable oppositions are deployed. As already suggested, this is true of the attempt to oppose historicism and formalism, or content versus form. It is also true of the historicism versus presentism binary, either in the sense of openness to the present-day significance and mobilization of insights drawn from the past, or in the related suggestion that historicism presents literature as reflecting what is, while formalism allows the agency of literature both in the constitution of that reality and also in the consideration of what could and should be. Any number of instances, say Chris van den Bosch's Reform Acts, Chartism and Social Agency in the Victorian novel of 2014, might illustrate how unsustainable either of these propositions are. Outside the programmatic hyperbole of prefaces and manifestos, the actual scholarship of the new formalism loses much of its anti-historicist bark and almost all of its anti-historicist bite. Provocations aside, practice suggests a broadening and not a relocation. There is little sign of claims for the autonomy or atemporality of the literary context is still king, even if the argument is often about establishing the right context. The analysis of new formalism remains rooted in richly realised situations, and the form of Victorian fiction is presented as produced by its contemporary engagements, be they intellectual or material, and the operations of texts are still primarily constructed out of contemporary critical responses. Foucauldianist epistemes and holistic cultural analysis may be out of favour, but the language of the Victorian period and generalised characterisations of Victorian culture remain pervasive. Indeed, one might suggest that the nearest this scholarship comes to anti-historicism in practice is in its less careful and respectful attitude to the archival engagements which its continued contextualism still require. And so at the risk of, of reinforcing the fact-checker stereotype of the historian, let me give you one example from Kornbler's, in many respects, impressive and suggestive realising capital. I've got some concerns about, some fundamental concerns about the way Kornbler's central notion of fictitious capital is located in contemporary usage, which I think systematically represents the journalistic texts that she invokes. But let me just give you one, in some respects, incidental but revealing example. So take this sentence from Kornbler. The repeal of the use of usury laws, proclaimed the Morning Chronicle, 
on the day after the Act's introduction will increase circulation and augment fictitious capital. Compare it with the Morning Chronicle article cited. This is the section. Note the imprecision of the quotation. Note the potentially significant elisions, especially the role that banknotes and not just credit play in this analysis. Note the misrepresentation of voice, that the citation is not, as might be reasonably construed, of the editorial persona of the Morning Chronicle or even of its city correspondent, but rather the reported opinion of the moneyed interest. Note how the careful modifiers as a whole bargain a favourable one. The idea, rather, are suppressed in the force of Cornblers proclaimed. For me, the frustration of the debate as it frame, is, is framed both by the historicism versus formalism opposition and by the invective of the V21 collective is that it skirts round what are surely the crucial questions which our response to historicism require us to address. How do we define the object of our inquiry? What then become appropriate subjects? And what are the appropriate procedures by which to prosecute our research? The first, of course, is the most straightforward and the most directly implicated in questions of historicism in that it asks, in what are we interested? Are we interested in the past, either, as the, either on the basis that by understanding the past we are better able to understand the present, or indeed that understanding the past is necessary for an effective understanding of its artefacts? If so then are we not historicists? What are the subjects of our study? Are we solely interested in textual effects and operations, in essentially disembodied ideas, or in a more three-dimensional canvas, a range of historical processes which lie in part outside of the text, which include institutions, individuals, acts and agencies, in circulation, reception and deployment? If so, are we not historicists? Are our interests more centrifugal or more centripetal? In seeking to construct an understanding of the past, do we accept the need to move at least in part beyond close reading of putatively self-contained structures of meaning and seek to draw on the full range of surviving evidence to situate each text in an external field of cultural force? Once again, if so, are we not historicists? And finally, in seeking to understand the capacities of narrative, either fictional or historiographical, the capacities indeed of any cultural artefact to communicate meaning or to provide resources for action, do we insist on the need for an act of translation, attentive to the difference in the systems of reference between the moment of its creation and of its potential deployment? If we do, then we are historicists. So where does this leave us? Not in rejecting formalism, not in arguing that historicism as practiced over recent years in Victorian studies and its constituent disciplines is without flaw, but rather contending that the anti-historicist position, especially in the more vehement idiom of more recent interventions, is intellectually unjustified and not an effective place from which to pursue a productive literary studies of the 19th century, never mind an interdisciplinary Victorian studies. The roots of the flaws or frustrations of the new historicism are not produced by its historicism, but rather by the ways in which that historicism is worked through. And the appropriate response is not to abandon historicism, but to refine its methods. In that sense, at least, I would agree with Bruno Latour. Our need is not, a way, is not to get away from facts, but to get closer to them. Not to fight empiricism, but to renew it. And that would make a Victorian studies fit for the 21st century. Thank you.